go mute that before that happens again. Okay, so Enmod, you're working behind the scenes, trying to get that going. The virus hits. Well, where does Enmod stand right now? Right now, I'm 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 in the biz, busy retooling the websites. I'm going to combine all three websites so that whenever I go to meet with, like, say, Lindsey Graham or a congressman, that I can as quickly and succinctly explain the problem and why a solution is necessary. Um, the problem with Climate Viewer and NMOD AA right now is that the information is so overwhelming. And I've done this through the perception management process of doing a perception audit on my audience, getting feedback from them saying, um, you know, what, it, what do you, what are you having trouble understanding? What are you having trouble finding? Um, whenever you show this to other people, what is their responses to it? And the overwhelming consensus is, it's big. <laughs> <clears throat> so what I'm trying to do now is, you know, basically make this as simple as possible by explaining, you know, like terminology, um, you know, the different types of technology, the techniques involved, like cloud seeding, cloud ionization, all of this, have very short, succinct, just one paragraph. This explains what this thing is. Because without that base level of information, people can't really get into the finer details or even begin to wrap their head around the fact that weather could be used as a warfare tool or that climate change could be climate changers. And once I've done that, then I'll be able to take the legislation to a representative and say, here is what's going on today. I don't know how familiar you are with this technology, but I'll be able to show them in five minutes as opposed to an hour. Because you're not going to get an hour with these people. And then that way, when I go to say, here's why this is necessary, they understand the scope of everything going on and understand that you know this is this is a necessary thing so right now that's my goal is to retool everything um make short five minute videos that explain each of the different technologies and then wrap a bow on it with and this is why we need in my day the idea is pretty much flawless. I've gotten the consensus of scientists, um, you know, a couple politicians, like I said, a Republican representative from Congress in Washington State. Um, he took interest in it. Um, so I've gotten some consensus already on this. And I've even got two of the two top geoengineers on the planet, Ken Calder and David Keith, have said, we would agree to this. James Roger Fleming, the guy who wrote that book that I showed you, Fixing the Sky, The Checkered History of Weather Modification and Climate, Weather and Climate Modification. Um, he said, this is a necessary thing. So obviously the idea is good. And it, they agree that not only is it a good idea that they could, you know, pallet it, you know, that it's okay to them, um, and that they would sign off on something like this. David Keith held, said, I, he would even lobby for it because I called him a lobbyist in one of our presentations. He obviously saw that it was an inside joke, but regardless, he said he would lobby for my, um, my law. I thought that was funny. Um, These were your intentions back in 2018. Yeah, and when I went to the Weather Mod Conference. Right. Yeah. And, and we met last year, so uh, what has progressed on your end? Where, where, where do you want it to go? Where I want it to go is the to get it into the law is actually an extremely simple process. Um, to make an amendment to the Environmental Modification Convention, it's in the language itself. It says that basically any state department can suggest an amendment to the UN Security Council. They have a vote on it and it is immediately law. So literally, I don't even have to speak to a congressman. Um, I have to just get somebody at the Department of State who is willing to go to the UN Security Council with a sheet of paper and say, we'd like to update NMOD. And this is how we'd like to update it. They have a vote, 
and it either happens or it doesn't. One of the groups I've been working with on, on this is the ETC group, um, Emerging Technologies Coalition or something like that, et cetera group. Um, they've been the strongest anti-geoengineering NGO in the world. They've actually stopped um, climate geoengineering programs in the past. Um, one, the most notably the SPICE program, Stratospheric Particle Injection for Climate Engineering over in the U UK, they put a stop to that experiment before it ever even happened. So Pat Mooney, Jim Thomas, Sylvia Riviero from ETC Group, I want to get with them because they already lobby at the UN um, and get them to help me make this a law. So not only going to our State Department in the United States, but get them internationally to get some backing on this um, and make it a reality. And then after the law becomes you know, the law of the land, then we work on making a U.S. version, a state-by-state -state version, and making the sensor for your backyard. So building the sensor network is the last step that's going to be an extremely complicated process, but it also will be the most informative. And it will be something that is groundbreaking, earth-shaking, and historic. There currently is no rainfall sampling network that literally tells you these are the chemicals that are in the rain that's coming down in your backyard. This is the electromagnetic radiation being emitted at your house. These are the cloud conditions over your house in 2020, 40 years from now. So we'll actually be creating a data set that will change humanity going forward. Um, that we can show trends over decades that, of information that they don't have. Um, that's, that's the biggest hole in climate change that to the, you know, to the climate change believers, the global warming believers, what they don't understand is they don't have enough information to make the kind of decisions they're making. It's very similar to the coronavirus situation we're in right now, where we have all these people making these dire predictions about the millions of Americans that possibly could die based on computer models. And as a computer programmer, as a gaming modeler, as a 3D designer, I understand that a computer model is only as good as the information you put into it. So if you have flawed information going into a simulation, you're not gonna get real world results. That's already proven true with the coronavirus. They were grossly wrong about everything. Um, they were wrong about how the infection rate. Many, many hundreds of times more people have been infected than they think, and they all were fine. My family personally went through it in January. We were all sick for like three weeks straight, could barely breathe, worst flu we ever had. Um, my wife's best friend, she was uh, diagnosed in the ER with viral pneumonia, which was more than likely COVID-19. Um, so it seems like a lot of us have already gone through it. Um, and there have been recent numbers coming out showing that 0 0.025, point, even 0.002% of the population is the death rate among healthy individuals. 0 0.025 of the population of the danger you know, group are the ones dying from it. So their computer models were completely wrong. We completely destroyed our economy. We've done martial law and socialism in America, in my lifetime, while Trump was president, all because a bunch of technocrats sitting around their freaking Mac earbooks, you know, punched in some numbers into some stupid computer model and made some dire predictions and then ruined our lives. Climate change is no different, except it's way more complicated. 
it's it's exponentially more complicated than infection rates in humans. We're talking about the sun, clouds, aerosol, gases, you know, liquid, you know, all of these dynamic chaotic parts moving. Then over time and all of this, um, when you think about the kind of computer models that would be necessary for you to accurately predict the climate, you realize that it's technically impossible today. The weatherman can't predict the weather seven days from now. They cannot predict cloud cover at all anywhere three days out. 66% of Iraqi sorties were canceled in Desert Storm because they couldn't predict the weather 48 hours out. Is that a car? No, that was 18 wheeler. Wow. Okay, so uh, sorties in the Iraq war. So yeah, 66% of the sorties were canceled because they couldn't predict the weather the very next day. So how could you possibly expect that you know, if the military can't predict the weather two days out, um, that these scientists can predict what the global temperature and weather is going to be like 10 years, 100 years from now. They're delusional. Um, and, and I keep going back to don't blame climate change, blame the climate changers. When you have also these people who are introducing even more chaos into a chaotic system, when you've got China, the Philippines, Russia, America, Iran, Iraq, I mean, India, uh, Israel, you, know, you name a country, they're modifying their weather. In America alone, there are you know, anywhere from 100 to probably 300 active weather modification projects going on at, a, at one time. And how those interact, you know, nobody knows. And nobody could know because they couldn't, even if they plugged it into a computer, they'd never be able to actually accurately predict what's going to happen. So the problem is that there are many people experimenting in the sky. We don't know what the results of that are going to be. They're creating climate chaos. They're blaming it on CO2 and cow farts. And nobody's taking responsibility for any of this. And what we know from the public side is that there is a multi-billion if not trillion dollar industry modifying the weather and then their secret government military weather warfare weather warfare happened in vietnam weather warfare happened in cuba in 69 if you think it's not happening today then you're delusional um uh, president ahmadinejad from iran said in 2011 that Europe was stealing their rain. He said it again in 2012. It hit 159 degrees in Iran. Flash forward to today, just last year, Brigadier General from Iran says, Israel and other countries are stealing their clouds. Now, that sounds like weather warfare to me. And that what, what goes hand in hand with weather warfare is economic warfare. When the CIA was stealing rain, what they called a rain embargo on Cuba, the purpose of stealing that rain by making it rain in the Gulf of Mexico and not on Cuba was to kill Castro's sugar crops, which would destroy them financially because that was one of their main exports. So, very yeah, so when you think about all of this together, is it possible today? If it was possible in the 60s, with the technology we have today, with the, the level of secrecy in the government, um, it's, it's extremely, it's, it's a certainty. It's not even a, is it possible? It is a certainty. Um, you can go to climateviewer.com and actually see the Freedom of Information Act requests from 1994 where the U.S. Navy at China Lake and the U.S. Air Force Research Lab at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base both saying, you know, I know there's NMOD, you know, on the books, but we should do weather warfare because our enemies are. So 
if it's coming straight from the horse's mouth, if the technology is there, the, the possibility is there, that we need to protect the public. This is ex extremely similar to nuclear disarmament. Mutually assured destruction. That was the term of the day. And they banned all upper atmospheric nuclear testing because of that. So what we need to do is recognize that Weather warfare is another one of those mutually assured destruction situations and that we need to have a ceasefire. And the only way to ensure that that ceasefire happens is through proper monitoring, as Ronald Reagan would say, trust but verify. It's fine and well to ban a thing. It's another thing to be able to verify it. When Kim Jong-un sets off a nuclear bomb, we know about it. Even though it's illegal, he does it. But we know about it because we have the international monitoring system. It's run by the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization. So they have infrasound recorders, which is lower than audible, you know, below our, our ability to hear infrasound. And then we have seismic detectors, same thing as earthquakes. They look for the signature of an earthquake caused by the nuclear blast. We have satellites in space. We have all these sensors to detect and triangulate where it happened because there's so many of them. They can go, well, you know, the sound reached here at 0.5 milliseconds, reached here at 0.8 milliseconds, reached here at 0.7 milliseconds, bing, bing, bing. It happened here. Um, so at the end of the day, we need an international monitoring system for weather warfare. We need transparency and verification from the corporations, from the public side. Tell us in advance that you're modifying the weather or doing experiments on the weather so that if you cause damage to life, limb, property, um, that you can be held account accountable in a court of law. Um, give us notification before experimentation. Because they're going to continue to do it. Banning weather modification in totality is an eventual goal. That would be great, um, but it's not a realistic goal as a starting point. So my realistic goal is transparency up front from the corporations and then verification. So you have to notify the International Registry of Atmospheric Experimentation that you're gonna modify the weather at a minimum of 48 hours before you do it. That way, the weather forecasters, the scientists, you know, the scientific community, and you know, all of us lay people can all wait and see what happens. And then if something bad happens, take them to court. Um, but they didn't break NMOD because benevolent weather modification is legal, but killing people is not. So, that's one solution for them. The solution for weather warfare is the military is not going to notify the International Registry of Atmospheric Experimentation because it's a secret program. So how do you catch a secret program with proper monitoring equipment? With this proper monitoring equipment will also come real climate change data. <laughs> because that's where we're lacking in the climate change world is we don't have enough information to make the kind of predictions we're making. We don't understand the aerosols, we don't understand galactic cosmic rays and how they form clouds and how the sun relates with all that. We don't un understand so much about the climate and the weather that's produced as a result of climate and all of these factors by having all of these sensors to be able to track this information and then track it over time and be able to tell what's falling in the rain. You know, is electromagnetics playing into this whole scenario that by doing all of these things that we will be able to actually catch somebody in the act for the first time in history. Um, and it's a national security issue for certain. Um, we, we shouldn't be left in a situation where another country can literally do weather warfare over America 
and we have no clue. Um, the CIA went to Alan Robach, prominent geoengineer, um, a couple years ago and asked if another country was doing um, geoengineering over our country, would we know it? And his answer was, I think so. But Diane Seidel went to the 20, 20th Conference on Planet and Inadvertent Weather Modification at the American Meteorological Society, mouthful, and she said, beyond a shadow of a doubt, no, we would not be able to detect it because our sensors aren't good enough. So that's the solution. Transparency up front, sensors on the back. Trust, but verify. So that's my goal with the NMOD AA. I think it's a reasonable goal. I think that it's also a goal that is achievable because it's not it's not going to destroy industry. It's less likely to get pushback from the individuals who are already doing weather modification. I have self-tested this. Even the geoengineering scientists are like, this would actually be necessary for us to even be able to do what we want to do because we don't have enough information. So at the end of the day, I feel like it's an inevitability how long it's going to take to do um, largely depends on how hard I push and how much luck I have. Um, but it also depends on you, um, you know, the viewer, the individual, you know what I mean? We are all rugged individualists and we need to all be educated on this. So that's why I do what I do with climateviewer.com. The purpose is to educate you on the whole man versus nature idea. We're, uh, so Jim, you did... All this research, tell me how many years you did the research and what was the most, shape your question into this, how many years you did it, what was the most interesting technological uh, advancement you saw? So I started researching weather modification, geoengineering, and space weather modification in 2008. So we'd say... 20, 12 years, 12 years now total. And I would say at the very beginning, I was more inclined to believe conspiracy theories. And as it progressed, and as I intentionally seeked out and confronted the debunkers, because I didn't want to be in an echo chamber. I didn't want to, you know, just get that self-confirmation bias thing going. Um, I wanted to be challenged because at one point I went and spoke at an EPA hearing. I literally gave my entire speech I was going to give on C-SPAN at the EPA hearing to the worst group of chemtrail trolls and said, have at it, bro. Pick it apart. Show me where I'm wrong. Now they have scientists and they have aviation industry people all in their group. These are pilots, people who work on jet engines, you know, meteorologists, all of them who just hate the chemtrail community. And I said, show me where I'm wrong. And they immediately went to ad hominem personal attacks. I said, you do realize I've already won. Because if there was something in there that was incorrect, You'd be correcting me on it. I know you guys. I know how you operate. You would be picking it apart line by line. And I just jumped up and down with joy going, well, my speech is perfect. I went and I gave my speech. Three years later, I was vindicated by seven different scientific journal, you know, major publications going, you know, Contrail induced cirrus clouds may have more effect on heating the climate than CO2. In fact, it may have more if, impact on the climate than all the CO2 that's ever came out of planes since they started flying planes. Something I said at the EPA here. So, yeah, you know, I've done my research. I've, I've gone away from the conspiracy side and tried to focus just on the stuff that I could prove beyond a shadow of a doubt. Like I, I, I like to say that I want to I be able to publish stuff that I could prove in court 
and that you could too. It's no good for me to just tell you, um, I really need to provide you with the same information that I'm using to make these judgments. So I've been completely transparent about everything by you know, literally providing all the source material that I'm basing these judgments on. So that if somebody were so inclined, they could go through this volume of information, they could go and do the exact same thing I'm doing. Somebody else could literally, they shot me dead today, somebody could pick this up and... Gotta finish that website too. Yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna finish the website. What technological advancement really was just like, this is, this is something I need to investigate further. What pulled you in more? What really got my goat was learning about geoengineering. Um, you know, it was one thing for people to talk about global warming. It was a total another thing to talk about the effects of creating artificial volcanoes in the sky, to create a sunscreen permanently to block out sunlight. Um, when I heard that, that just fascinated me. And I said, I've got to know more about this. The people who are proposing it, the people who are pushing it, because we've already had a hundred years of weather modification without anybody knowing about it. Very few people, less than 1% of the planet, knows that there's weather control even going on. And now you're talking about global weather control. If you intentionally inject chemicals into the stratosphere to block sunlight, it changes rainfall patterns on a worldwide basis. They have admitted that it will kill many tens of thousands of people. And their estimates are always wrong. So it could possibly end up killing millions of people. So we, we don't know what the future holds. And if, if we were to start to block out sunlight, how could we ever get to having solar panels and being independent and off the grid um, if people are dumping chemicals in the sky and controlling how much sunlight you get? Oh, they're already doing that with jet air tra traffic. Um, which has been one of the shiny sides of this quarantine is bright blue skies that I haven't seen in years because none of these globalist technocrats or these, you know, Hollywood elites, they're not flying to and fro, um, you know, at, at the rate of 120,000 flights a day. Um, so we're not getting this, you know, constant dumping of chemicals into the troposphere where we live. But the thing about that is, dumping those chemicals into the troposphere, making cirrus clouds, making all these, they have an average lifetime of about two weeks. If you do it in the stratosphere, the resident time, which is how long these chemicals can hang out, could be one to 10 years. So if you geoengineer just for one year, it might be 10 years before all of that stuff finally makes its way out of the air. That's why this must be stopped. That's why it, it's a thing that should not be. That's why I support the ETC group's manifesto on um, a permanent ban on geoengineering, hands off Mother Earth. Um, that geoengineering is a thing that should never ever occur. Even David Keith is starting to come around and saying, um, you know, maybe, I, maybe I, I, I really hope that we never have to geoengineer. We're studying this just in case climate change and global warming gets too bad and we need it. Um, but in a best case scenario, this would never happen. It was invented, it was really pushed from Lawrence Livermore National Lab in 1994 from a guy named Dr. Evil, Edward Teller, Lowell Wood, and Roderick Hyde. Lowell Wood was known as Dr. Evil, he invented the hydrogen bomb and uh, he invented it as the weapon to never be used. A weapon so scary that it would keep the enemy from even trying. So he literally invented a weapon that was never to ever be dropped. And then he went on to take Caesar, Cesare Marchetti's idea from 1977, even before that 1965, and JFK, they mentioned geoengineering, restoring, the, um, restoring our climate. Um, he took those ideas and revived them and, and basically said, what if we were to spray a bunch of aluminum into the sky and mimic volcanoes? So for it to come from Dr. Evil, the guy who made the weapon 
to never be used. I believe geoengineering is the weapon to never be used. It is a weapon of fear. If you do not stop polluting, but of course they talk about CO2, not actual pollution. If you do not stop emitting CO2, we will geoengineer. And it will kill people. And it will control rainfall on a worldwide basis. And there will be dead people. So the only thing holding up geoengineering right now is, as they put it, how to deal with the losers. And that is dead people. Okay, so you've kind of touched on this, but give me three informative points people need to know about to help assist with deprogramming individuals. How do we break through? Give me three things of when you're meeting an individual for the first time of introducing them to weather modification when they're rooted in climate change. Well, first off, I tell them, you know, what I told you about the, the weather. Okay, if they can't predict the weather seven days from now, how could they possibly predict, um, you know, the, what the climate's going to be like in 10 years? They're like, you're right. Uh, the, the other one I, I commonly do is I go, what's that? And they're like, it's a cloud. I said, really? You ever seen a straight cloud in your life? A straight cloud? Yeah. And then they go, and they look at it again, and they go, wait a minute, what is that? <laughs> Instant. There are no straight lines in nature. <laughs> so um, that's, that's one of my my two favorite go-to lines, you know, to like shake a person real quick. Um, and of course we get into the whole, well, that's made by a plane and that's not natural. That's not a natural cloud, but later today it's going to be completely overcast. You wait, you'll see. And then the, the third thing I, I tend to do is, you know, either whip out my website, which is, you know, always my go-to weapon of choice and just whip out weather modification history. And I'm like, you know, that's a thing. Um, but what I, what I basically tell people is, you know, that it's about control. Whenever people are passing these laws, um, whether it's, you know, about climate change or any, you know, right now we're in this quarantine, um, that they're passing these laws to strip you of your liberties. And I believe it was Ben Franklin that said that those who would give up essential liberty for temporary salvation deserve neither. And that is the truth. We have to protect our freedom and our liberty at all costs. And I do mean all costs. That's why we have a Second Amendment. Um, and I hope it never really comes to that. That's why I'm proposing this NMOD AA as a way to save people from violence. And I've literally said this directly. Chris Fallen, pr previous director of HARP, talked to him on the cell phone. Um, David Keith, Ken Caldera, top geoengineers in the world, they get death threats on a daily basis. And I tell them, here's a way to stop that. Two, because all lives matter, even yours. And I don't, I don't see these, you know, whereas 12 years ago I might have demonized these people, I see all individuals through shades of gray. And I believe that a lot of these people, even the geoengineers, um, Ken Caldera, he started out as a guy who was trying to save coral reefs. He saw them turning white. I can understand that. He has protested in front of nuclear you know, power plants. Pretty freaking cool. Now he wants to save the world from climate change. He's actually moved on to other things now. But regardless, I believe their heart is in the right place. When I watched this documentary on, um, it was either Hulu or Netflix, it's called Owning the Weather. And it literally, somebody had gone to the West Texas Weather Modification Association and was interviewing the guys who were doing the cloud seeding projects. And the one guy that really got to me, he, he's like, you know, my granddaddy flew these planes, you know, and, he, and because we need water and water is life. And it really clicked to me that, you know, that what this guy's doing, he doesn't see as a bad thing. He may not understand that what he's doing may give him some extra rain and may cause a storm to be much worse in the next state. But at the, at the, at the, at the root of everything, I believe these people's hearts are in the right place. 
the thing is we have to get them to understand that they could be hurting people. And that's with geoengineering beyond a shadow of a doubt. Not only is it going to hurt people, it's going to change lives, everybody's lives from the day it's legalized going forward. And I don't want that for my kids. My two daughters will not grow up in a geoengineered world, period. If, and I will do whatever it takes to ensure that that happens. Which is about NMOD. Okay, I got two more questions. I just want to change. Give me the potentials of NMOD. What do you see it doing? And I'm looking at more of a, a holistic spiritual standpoint of like breaking people out of the rigmarole of politics, out of the rigmarole of like legislation. Like what does it do holistically for a person? Health. Okay. Um, my, my addendum to NMOD called the Environmental Modification Accountability Act um, is a way to bring safety to the individual, to bring clarity of mind, to end fear of the unknown. Right now we're in a situation where there are, you know, millions of individuals who are scared of clouds coming out of planes. What they don't realize is it's the invisible that's even more scary. Truth is always scarier than fiction. The problem with the truth of weather modification and weather warfare is that it's been going on for a hundred years and nobody's been made aware of it. So my solution would bring that awareness to everybody simultaneously, something that the powers that be, the militaries, and probably even the companies themselves, they don't want that attention. Um, and they certainly don't want any kind of liability. So what I hope to do is ensure that people can live a fear-free life, know that the, you know, their organic garden is not filled with chemicals that were dumped by you know, a military organization, some company that's you know, trying to keep hail from destroying somebody's billion dollar corn crop, um, that you have peace of mind to know that the weather that is occurring over your home was caused by nature, not man. Okay, and you have this solution uh, based off of what you could do with NMOD, and there's a technical technical aspect to it. There's the devices, there's the what you want to put in backyards. Mm -hmm. um, is Do you see people becoming more dialed in with that? Because I'm in this realm right now of like being, trying to pull out of being dialed in, not wanting to be connected to cell phone towers, not wanting to be yeah. manipulated by frequencies. So how do you implement something that, that breaks people away from the fear of frequencies, the fear of being dialed into towers well, or it, nanotechnology, it, like you're going to put these systems in people's backyards. So how does that tie into people being healthy? Okay. Well, if you're completely clueless and you're not EMF sensitive and you just run Wi-Fi all day anyway, of course we'll have a wireless version that you can put in your backyard. But as an individual who has suffered from Graves' disease and cured it by dialing back my EMF exposure and changing diet and exercise routines, um, everything in my house is wired. I don't do wireless. So of course there would be a hardwired version where you could use a LAN Ethernet cable buried in the backyard or on top of your house um, so there would be no emitting EMF frequencies. Um, and this is referring to the climate viewer. That's, that's where the whole name comes from. Um, the idea that you have a unit on top of your house, in your backyard, it views your local climate and then allows the entire world to view the climate as a whole by collecting all of this information. So what would it have in it? An all sky camera. It's a 360 degree view of all the clouds flying over, what the weather looks like. It would take an enormous data server farm to collect all this information and keep the video and all of that. It would be big as YouTube, except it would be for science um, and safety. 
Um, it would take massive investments. That's why it's the last thing on my list to do. Um, but being able to collect weather data, pressure data, um, electromagnetic frequency spectrum and power rating, power density, um, being able to detect like ELF waves locally, um, being able to see what's coming down in your rainfall, literally having a rainfall tube that fills up and then it does a spectral analysis on it, prints that out, sends it to the web, and then opens up the bottom of the, the rain cup and dumps it out until the next time it rains and does another analysis. All of this fed live to a map in real time where you could literally go to you know, each one of the dots and say, let me click on somebody near me and see if they're getting the same results as me. Um, and then with all of this information, you'd be able to print out amazing presentations of, look, you know, somebody put cesium-137 in the gas tank of a jet aircraft and flew it across America. And you can see right here where radioactive isotopes literally went through these counties and it follows this flight line. You've seen that? No, nobody has because it's not possible right now. That's why I'm saying um, whenever Fukushima happened, they cut EPA's rad net off. They did the same thing in Canada. They just shut off the radiation detection network. So I want a climate viewer that can do all of the above. That it's testing the air we breathe, the water falling on us, um, and the electromagnetic frequency you know, that's affecting all of our health. So if we could get radiation detection, electromagnetic radiation detection, um, spectral analysis on rainfall and, you know, air sampling, it's going to be downright expensive. But the thing is, everything gets smaller and cheaper every single year. So this is also an inevitability that we could make a unit that's cheap enough that it's about the same price as a freaking Xbox. And if you can afford an Xbox, then you can go and afford a climate viewer for your backyard. Um, and then if you've got the extra money and you want to buy the top of the line model that has radiation detection and EMF, then you can get the upgraded version. Um, but regardless, you got to start somewhere. And I, I want the base model to at least have like the camera um, you know, the rainfall detection, um, you know, like what chemicals are coming down in your rain? Because I see organic gardeners who would probably be stunned to realize that there's glyphosate raining down on um, their, their crops. You know, like, I thought it was organic. No, you have to grow indoors with purified water to know that it was truly organic. Um, so that's, that's my goal for this whole climate viewer idea is that, you know, it, it's a system that gives you peace of mind. And that's the wifey. Is she here? No, she's probably overdue at this point. You want to take it? Hello, darling. I'm doing well. We were wrapping up the last question right now. Um, what is social distancing evoking you? Control. Uh, martial law. Um, tyranny. All of the above. Well put. I know you have plenty more to say about that. <laughs> we don't have to, though. But I think those are uh, simplest I, terms that are all that... Social distancing. What, 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 what this? Oh yeah, I said it back. It's probably good that it's not on. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So th that's really good, Jim. Why did you do this? Yeah, you may have answered this already, but you can answer it again. Why are you doing this? When I was a Boy Scout, I was taught to do a good turn daily, and I drank a lot of alcohol, did a lot of drugs in high school. I partied hard. I did a whole lot of nothing after, um, in my twenties. Um, and then I had a kid 
And then I realized that there was more to life than just me. And now I can't not think about their future. So that's why I do what I do. Cool. Thanks for what you do, brother. Thank you for what you do too, man. I'm trying. We all are. Every day. Always better together. You got that right. More the merrier. It's just trying to get people on board. It's frustrating talking to some. But there have been some great conversations so far coming up here. Just stopping and talking to people. And people know. People are starting to know. They just don't know what to do. If this video resonates with you, leave me a comment because I love hearing from you all. First time here? Be sure to subscribe and click the bell. The bell doesn't always work, so come to ClimateViewer.com and sign up for our newsletter. Remember, it would be impossible for me to do this without your support, so please join my Patreon or buy me a coffee on PayPal. And always, attack ideas, not people. Kids are impressionable. That's why here at this station, we watch the programs and commercials your child watches carefully. He may see bad guys, but not in the role of heroes. And he'll learn that crime doesn't pay. Because your child's welfare is our concern, too. That's part of our code. Better than anything you can get without a prescription. Anything. It's the best.